Here I got a Husband medium temperature case, Delicacen case, this one here. And if you look on the bottom left hand corner of these units, they'll have the model number right there, D512. It's got three fans in it and all the fans are working. The case is not really severely froze up, but we've got a bad dryer here. And it turned out to be that this was just the beginning of my problems. So let's get started, find out what happened. And here's another look at the case from the outside. This is behind the counter it's a service deli case so they mostly had it empty you know the first thing i did i checked the model number made sure it was there because i got to document that after i made sure that the temperature was up of course and so i pulled off the little bottom covers made sure all the fans were working they were made sure we weren't froze up too heavily and we're not but it's just not holding temperature so up here at the controller everything seems to look all right not really necessarily too bad we got a suction set point that seems to be holding okay but this is one of those stores where they do not have any temperature monitoring or any temperature sensors coming into the Danfoss controllers for any other circuit. Open up my alarm screen and I see that we have a couple of notices here, but nothing for the compressor, nothing for any of the circuits, which we wouldn't have for the circuits anyways. We just have this G2 alarm. It's on a different suction group. So we're not gonna really worry about those. All these other alarms that are further down are from several days ago, so we're not gonna worry about those at all either. Being that I had some light ice formation, I decided to run a defrost cycle and start fresh. Here I'm showing how to do that by selecting the desired circuit and using the number pad to make selections instead of the arrows. If you want to, you can use the arrows, but it doesn't really matter. Both of them are going to do the same thing. Now we see that it's in defrost. Both red lights mean they're currently in defrost. Taking it out of defrost basically is the same procedure as initiating the defrost. Locate the circuit and select it. Hit enter and choose end manual mode, which is 37. Hit enter again and then backspace out and it's back in refrigeration. So here's how the case is laid out. We've got three evaporators in there. This is the left one. Then we got the middle one here that has the T and then we've got the one on the right side, which is where the dryer's at. And you can see that the dryer is condensating really bad on the outlet and not condensating on the inlet. Fortunately here we've got two valves, on one on each line, we've got a ball valve on the suction and a ball valve on the liquid. Most of the time you only see them on the liquid. So we just valve the circuit off and then recover the pressure that's in there and we can get started. Now something you can do if you want to reuse your refrigerant, your reclaimed refrigerant, and you label each jug for what refrigerant is what and you get it and it's brand new and it's in a deep vacuum and you know it's clean, you can use a dryer on your inlet but if you use the dryer on your inlet make sure you cap it off every time you're not using it otherwise it'll just fill up with moisture and that kind of defeats the point anyways if you're not going to reuse your refrigerant and you don't really care well you could just make something like this if your recovery machine has a female inlet connection and then you're good to go now when you find that you cannot rotate your ball valve clockwise to close it you just need to loosen up the top nut that keeps it tight like about a half turn and then you can close the ball valve. Don't force it or you can snap it. So I always sand before I cut or unsweat. I like to do it that way, I find it easier. Let me know if you don't find it easier or if it doesn't matter to you. And I went with a bigger dryer because, well, that's the only one I had. I actually did have one the same size, but I didn't want to use it because obviously this system has some contamination in it. So I went with the bigger one. And, but since I cut out the dryer, I took some copper with me, so I need to make me a small little piece of copper that has a coupling, slip coupling on one side and just a standard 3 8 on the other.
Make sure not to point the torch downward to burn the plastic drain pan, because that would be bad. And at the same time, make sure not to use too much solder and then get that solder too hot to where it drips a hole in your drain pan, because that would be just as bad. You know, the wiser thing would be, if you could find a piece of sheet metal, put the piece of sheet metal underneath your work area, above the plastic that you want to protect, and that would be the best option. I used to do that kind of stuff, you know, to protect my work area. Maybe now, maybe it's just me, maybe I just don't give a shit, I don't know. Now this little piece here that I made, that I made a swedge out of, it is a soft copper. What do y'all think about this? Do you think that Lining it with some solder, you know, putting a coat of solder on that small piece of soft copper makes it more stronger and more durable, or not? Now, so once I'm done here, I insert the suction side valve core and then open the suction line ball valve a little bit. You can't see it just outside the video frame here, but that's what I was doing. And this does a purge of the dryer that flows out the service valve that has the stem still out. Let it flow for a few seconds and put the valve core back in. And now I'm ready to open the liquid line valve and the circuit is restarted. But it didn't take long to see that we still had a problem. A second restriction upstream at the solenoid valve. I only wonder why it wasn't sweating before I replaced the dryer. Because I should have seen this if it was happening earlier. So this is one of the most basic of solenoid valves. It does not have a manual lift. In case you don't know what that is, it's a stem entering from the valve from the bottom. It's also half inch, which I did not have on my truck. And it uses an MKC-1 coil, which I didn't have either. The closest that I had was a 5.8 solenoid valve with a manual stem. And I also had the dual voltage MKC-2 coil that it required, which I wired up as 120 volt, and I installed them both. To pump down this circuit, not only do we have to close the liquid line ball valve, but if you look closely at the EPR, you'll see this hose coming into it. That's high pressure from the discharge header that lays behind the liquid line header, and it must be closed too. Then once the circuit has suction header pressure on both the liquid line and suction line, in this case that would be around 35 to 36 PSI, we close the suction ball valve and remove the remaining pressure to be able to work on replacing the solenoid. And then here's the old one after I took it out. And these are the tags from the parts. I like to keep my tags and put them in my back pocket. Helps me at the end when I'm doing my invoicing. And here's a look at the new 5 8 solenoid valve installed with the MKC2 coil. And it doesn't look pretty, but it'll work. And now finally, I have low temperature occurring. I had adjusted the EPR, so that's why it's gotten even lower than what it should be. So I just got to do some EPR adjustments, and then I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm finished. Finally. Getting closer to where it needs to be. That's it. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to the channel. I appreciate the support. I'll see you later.